Revelation. Revelation, or as B.R. Lakin used to, to say, the book of the Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 21. I want to talk a little bit this morning about the new Jerusalem, our home in glory that is promised to us. Uh, we look down through the ages. Brother Phil does a lot of things on prophecy and has the big charts and tells you all the things that are lined up for the Christian, the child of God. Of course, the next big event on God's time table is the rapture of the church, the calling out of Christ's bride. If when that happens, it will usher in the period of time called the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week, also referred to as the great tribulation period. And the church is gone, but when that happens, what's going on in heaven during that seven-year period is the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then the Lord comes back. Uh, it's referred to as the second advent. The rapture is not the second advent. There's nothing that said that the Lord comes all the way to the earth. We're caught up together with him in the air. But then you have the second advent where the Lord returns <coughs> And sets up his kingdom. You have the battle of Armageddon there at the end of the tribulation. The Lord comes. And Satan is bound for a thousand years. And the Lord sets up a thousand year reign on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. Now following that thousand years, Satan's loosed from his chains and for a short time. And then he's taken again, cast into the lake of fire. Fire and brimstone comes down and destroys him. And then it talks about a time when the, the, the earth and the heavens which are now shall melt away with fervent heat and, and the heavens are done away with. Uh, and when that occurs, then John says that he saw the new Jerusalem coming down and that's the city that we'll be living in. Even the fellow says, I don't like the city, you will like this one. Uh, uh, they give the measurements in that and someone figured that it's about like a uh, from, from where we are, like to Miami, Florida, up to, to Baltimore, Maryland, across to Denver, Colorado, and then back down that, that city, four square. Uh, someone had figured at, 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 say, 100 million Christian folks being saved every year. Uh, when, that, when that occurs, there's still probably going to be enough uh, room in that city for everyone, every Christian, to have like a 10-room mansion. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? A lot of the new versions will say rooms or dwelling places. Now, I'm going to get a mansion because God promised me one. So we're going to get into this, and the, and the, the focus of the message is this morning on acquiring a taste for our new location, our new home. Acquiring a taste for the things of God. You know, it's an acquired taste. It don't come automatically. You have to submit to that. Once you get saved, you have to submit to that Holy Spirit of God. You can sear your conscience. You can ignore the Spirit. And you'll never, you'll, you'll never be ready when the Lord comes back for that new lifestyle. And we'll see where the Bible encourages us to do that. Now in Revelation 21 and verse 1, John says this. He said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I like that verse because one place it says that our sin will be cast into the depths of the sea. And we see from this verse that there will be no more sea. Where are your sins? They're gone. Just thought I'd throw that in. And verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain there ought to be some amens going on with that little verse right there folks no more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new and he said to me right for these words are true and faithful then in verse 10 21 to revelation 21 10 and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god having the glory of god and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal 
and he had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square and the length as large as a breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length of the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall uh, of it was as was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, likened to clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, and the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx. Of the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprasus, and eleventh, adjacent, and twelfth, the amethyst, and amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every single gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, if you want to write down Psalms 89, uh, verse 36 and 37, will give you an indication that on the earth, the sun and the moon will still be there to light the earth, but the glory of the new Jerusalem will be lit by the glory of God. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the promise, not only of eternal life, but, Lord, for the promise of a, of a life wherein dwelleth righteousness, Lord. No more sin, no more craziness, no more, uh, uh, no more jails, no more insane asylums, Lord, but the glory of God. And thank you, Lord, for those precious promises. You tell us that in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, Lord. Let us look forward to that, Lord, and let us uh, get our lives in order that it might not be culture shock when we finally arrive there, Lord, that we'll know of the things of God and we'll have practiced the things of God. Help me as I preach today, Lord. Hold me up by the power of your might. If there's any who has never trusted you for salvation, it would be a good day, Lord. Lord, uh, for that person to come forward and trust Christ, Lord, get alone with you and submit themselves to your saving blood. All this we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. What's the old song? I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Oh, i got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Woo, doggy. Man, I, I hope some of this crowd gets fired up this morning. You've got a home in glory land if you're born again. We say, what's it take to do that? Uh, simply going to God and say, God, I know I'm a mess. You tell me I'm a mess. All I've sinned and come short of the glory of God. I know I'm a mess. I believe you're the Savior, and I'm asking you, Lord, the best way I know how to be merciful to me, a sinner. He won't refuse you. Why would he refuse you? Let me get back to the message. In 2 Peter, I'm going to be in 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Watch it. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. My, 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 now here's the message. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, everything, that that, uh, nice pickup you've got, it's going to be dissolved, folks. My, 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 that closet full of clothes. Well, let me move on. What, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation 
and godliness. Hey, knowing what God has told us, what's in your future, you need to get some things in order with your life. You need to, get, need to get acquainted with the things of God and acquire a taste for the things of God and the things of holiness and the things of righteousness. It says in verse 12 here, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. In verse 13 it says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Did you see that? It's going to be righteousness at that time. Uh, wherefore, because of this, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. All right, so we look this morning at our future homes as Christians. The world in which we live today will one day melt away. It'll all be gone, melt, melt away with a, a fervent heat. Now, the global warming folks know that already. They just got the context wrong. Uh, the Bible says in, in Genesis 8, 22, that heat and cold and day and night and summer and winter will remain. As long as the earth remaineth, that stuff's going to still go on. So be careful what you hear from that crowd. But here's the real global warning when uh, this earth and all the elements shall be dissolved and melt away with fervent heat. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And about this new heaven uh, and new earth, the Bible says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. My, my, my. Now it says in our text here in 2 Peter that because of what's going to happen, we as Christians should be preparing to live for the glory of God and to do it God's way. Now it said, watch it, watch it now. Uh, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Some of you folks need to change some of your ways and get prepared for a new lifestyle. Some of the lifestyles that you're living today may not be a fit too well in the new Jerusalem, may not fit too well in that heavenly crowd. Man, what a time that'll be. I remember uh, many years ago, I was appointed to the uh, police academy in the city of Miami, Florida, back in the 1970s. And uh, I knew as part of, of that uh, police academy, it was a six-month police academy, and I knew that physical fitness was a big part of it. So I, I went down and started to work out every day. I started to get in shape. I knew there was a physical agilities part of, of, of that uh, police program. I had to do so many sit-ups. I'd have to do so many push-ups. have to do so many pull-ups. I'd have to run the 100-yard dash in a certain time limit. I'd have to run a mile in a certain time limit. I'd have to do a standing broad jump, uh, uh, all those things. So I... I kind of tried to get my lifestyle changed and where I could be physically fit when I went there. Well, a lot of you folks need to get your spiritual lifestyle in order and start making some changes in your life so you'll fit in with that heavenly crowd. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Hey, some Christians are looking for it, and some aren't. Hmm. I'm afraid that for many Christians, the things of God, uh, God's purity, His holiness, the righteousness of God is a taste for, that many have yet to acquire. Hmm. Holiness is an acquired taste. You got to want it. You're not going to develop it if you don't want to. Hey, you need a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. To please God. You know, I remember as a boy, I, I tried to drink coffee. I wanted to drink coffee. My daddy was a coffee drinker. All the Gabbard, big coffee drinker. First time I drank a cup of coffee, I spewed it out. It's the most bitter thing I'd ever tasted. But I wanted to be like my daddy. I wanted to be like my earthly father and 
He, he didn't have a meal without a, a cup of scalding hot, black, strong coffee. And as every meal, it didn't matter if it was 110 in the shade, he still had a hot coffee with his meal. So I kept, I kept sipping on it and sipping on it, and finally I developed a taste for coffee. I can't imagine for the last many, many years of ever getting up in the morning without a cup of coffee. It's an acquired taste. Now, I wish I lived closer to Kaylee's uh, coffee shop down there, Kay's Coffee Something. And uh, I'd say, okay, I'm kind of broke this week. Could you maybe get me a cup of coffee? <laughs> She'd say, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come now. <laughs> hey, holiness is, a requ- is an acquired taste. And, and even though those first cups of coffee I tried were bitter, I learned to love and to savor it. And that's what we need to do with the things of God. See, this, this world has have us in a lifestyle that is totally contrary to the things of God, to the word of God. Not, not many go by that. Like my brother told my mama one time, said, I don't go by that. Well, what do you go by? You claim to be a Christian? Now, now listen, I said that to say this. Many Christians have never acquired a taste for the things of God. The psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth. In him. Why don't you taste him? Why don't you try to develop a taste for the things of God? The Lord said, Malachi, of course, the context is giving, but it works in all areas. The Lord said, Prove me herewith and see. You try me out. Prove me herewith and see if I want to open the windows of heaven and pour out, pour you out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. Have you tried him? Have you tasted of our, uh, that precious life that Jesus Christ empowers you to live if you'll yield to it? If you walk in the light as he is in the light. Many simply want to hold on to the things of this world to, ex- to the exclusion of the things of God. Many have not acquired a taste for the things of God because they just don't want to. They want to do it their way. I did it my way. Sure you did. How many, how many of you parents have had kids? Had kids that they, they won't any, eat anything but mac and cheese and hot dogs. You put it in front of them and, and, and they'll turn up a, a lip toward you. They don't want to eat that stuff. Lots of ketchup. Huh. For me, it was banana pudding. I wanted banana pudding every meal. Mm. Hey, they'll tell you that they don't like something without ever tasting it. Oh, I don't like that. They've never eaten it, never tasted it. And they say they don't like it. Hmm. What's that about? See, their minds are already made up. A lot of folks' minds are made up today. They're so infatuated with this world and this lifestyle and all the glamour and the the things that go with it. They don't want anything to do with the things of God. Might cramp their style a little bit. Hmm. Hey, there uh, there isn't just a famine of the word of God. Brother Phil talked about this morning. There's a famine of all the things of God, the righteousness of God. The holiness of God. Hey, some of you think that when you get to heaven, you're going to waltz in there with your Haggard and and Jones CDs or Rolling Stones and Elton John and ACDC and and man, you're going to live it up. No, it isn't going to work that way, big boy. It's not going to work that way. Some think they'll have a big screen TV and watch all the Reds and the Bengals games. (laughs) <laughs> what are they about? About three and thirteen this year. Well, today's a new opportunity to lose a ball game for the Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> a lot of folks from Boston to him, man, they'll want to have their golf clubs, fishing poles, their guns. Hey, the Lord might let me have my Martin guitar. <laughs> a lot of music up there. Golf clubs, fishing poles, their guns. Oh, got kind of quiet. Feather cell, now you're meddling, preacher. <laughs> hmm. Hey, 
I don't know what it is that you've acquired a taste for here on earth, but those worldly things, guess what? They're going to melt away with fervent heat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Hey, Colossians 3, 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. God wants you to live godly. He wants you to acquire a taste for the things of God. That way you'll appreciate and love heaven. So much more. Hey, just as a boy who wants to acquire a taste for the things that his father likes, our Heavenly Father wants you to acquire a taste for those things that he likes and for who he is and what he is. Be ye Christ-like. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Hey, the only way you're going to acquire those tastes is to do the things of God. You know what God's about? God has a place for his people. It's called the local church. That's where God's people gather at the local church. The Bible says the Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. Well, I don't think you got to go to church. There's a lot of things you don't think. God loved the church and gave himself for it. David said in Psalms 122, 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 1 Timothy 3, 15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, watch it, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You need to raise those babies in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and find you a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching local church. Hmm. Well, I won't make my kids go to church. My mama made me, I'm not going to make my kids go to church. How many times you heard that? Do you make them take a bath? Do you make them brush their teeth? Do you make them go to bed at night? Mm, getting kind of quiet in here. Hey, some of hey, you better be saving up your bail money. Hey, some of you may have waited too long to get your kids in church. They're done grown. They've done moved on. But how about your grandkids? You can get your grandkids in church. Hmm. God has a place for his people, his children to grow and the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, a pray, place with a prayer life that will lift up your kids when they're hurting, when they've had that accident. You've got a place that you can get God, where God's people gather. You can call upon the, that church to pray for that baby. God has a place for his people to grow. God has a textbook for this life. Have you acquired a taste for the word of God? Isaiah said, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. What did Joshua say? He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all the things that are written therein. Then shalt thou make thy way prosperous. Then shalt thou have good success. God has a textbook, a life manual. You can find the mind of God in this book. The Lord says, the, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Psalms 138 and verse 2, David said, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth Watch it, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You study about that a while, big boy. You try to figure that one out. If you think that book isn't important. A lot of folks just follow the version of the week. There's about 200 versions out there today. You take your pick, whichever one suits your, your sin. Uh, whichever one has eliminated the admonition against your sin. 
That'd probably be the one you want to run with. And, and if you wait, there'll be a new one out next week that will eliminate a whole bunch of other things that God's Word never let you get by with. <laughs> Seek you out of the book of the Lord and read. Hey, how, how about the music of God? Do you like spirit-filled music? Do you sing to the Lord? Are you singing to each other? You say, well, what are you? Well, and that's okay to edify the church. But how about the music of God? When's the last time you plugged that into your headphones? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks. I was going to pull out a phone, but it's in the car. Eternal, bright, and fair. Speaking. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A lot of folks don't sing because they don't have anything to sing about. Hey, and David, 2 Samuel 6, 5, and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. David spake to the chief of the Levites, 1 Chronicles 15, 16, to appoint their brethren to be singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps, and cymbals sounding by lifting, lifting up the voice with joy. Hey, if you brought cymbals in here, you set up a set of drums, a bunch of cymbals in here, especially loud cymbals, it'll hair lip about every Pharisee in the next two miles. I don't like drums. God never asked your opinion. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. All manner of instruments. Hey, a lot of us think that if, if I don't like it, then God must not like it. Ever had that attitude? Well, yeah, I don't like it, so obviously God don't like it. Mm, you're kind of in a tough spot there. Second Chronicles uh, 5, 5, 13, it even came even to pass as a trumpeter. Anybody like I love trumpets. Of course, I think, when I think of trumpets, I think of the Johnny Cash song. Da, 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 da. Uh, never, let me move on. <laughs> the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in the praising and thanking the Lord. What were they playing them for? To praise and to thank the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then, then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. There's sure a place for music. You find a church with no spirited music program, they won't be around too long. Or they'll run about 15 30 people. Sing unto him a new song, the psalmist said. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Well, I don't know if I like that verse. Psalms 155, praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise upon the high sounding cymbals. I don't like it loud. Cody Jones and I went to a Reds ball game one night, and there's a, a teenager walking in front of us on the back of his T-shirt. It, it said, if it's too loud, you're too old. <laughs> That's just what the T-shirt. I'm not expounding that at all. I'm probably the oldest man. Well, not only you not like it, not, you don't like it loud, you probably don't like it at all. God says his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He knows some things you don't know, and he understands things you don't understand. God likes some things that maybe you don't like. How about your prayer life? Do you have one? Do you want one? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have a prayer life because I don't want a prayer life. Until somebody gets sick. Until that big C word enters the picture. Then all of a sudden, as my mama used to say, when it, when it happens to General Blackbird, and when it happens to you, it's a different story. How about your praise life? You ever praise him? Just thank you, God. Thank him and praise him. Amen. Hey, there's going to be a lot of things going on in glory that you may not quite be ready for. Jesus said he's gone to prepare a place for you. But many, many Christians, for whatsoever reason, have never prepared a place in their life and their hearts 
for the Lord. Hmm. Never allowed yourself to acquire a taste for the things or the ways of God. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. Are you ready for heaven this morning? Have you tried to do anything to get in shape for a new lifestyle, for a city wherein dwelleth righteousness? Maybe you're here and you've just never trusted Christ for salvation. Why not? Paul said, I fear lest any corrupt you from the simplicity that is in Christ. Everyone stand up this morning. The Bible says we're all a mess. It says we're all sinners. It said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. We've all gone out of the way. We've all become as an unclean thing. And you know what? Because of our sin, there's a penalty that God requires. He said for the wages of sin is death. Somebody has to die for your sins. It can either be you or you can trust Christ who tasted death for every man. All you have to do is say, yes, I'm going to trust Jesus Christ. So I don't have to pay the death because he already paid with his death on the cross. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Don't say you might be. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. You don't earn a gift. You've got a giver, Jesus Christ, and you've got a receiver, whosoever will. Let him come. The altar's open.